So, welcome everyone to the seventh webinar. Um, this is going to be going about multi-body dynamics and how that can be used in some of your analysis and also building your model in a program called Motion Solve. And so today we're very lucky is the industry representative that we've got in um, is a gentleman by the name of Brett Longhurst and he is from Bremer Auto. So Brett um, is a very, very highly capable engineer, especially around suspension modeling, um, has had a lot of years experience in developing suspension models, as well as a number of other engineering CAE models through FEA and CFD as well. But today, hopefully Brett will be able to give us a bit of insight into what it, what, what it is, is that he does and how we can use that in the FSAE modeling of your cars. So I'll hopefully get Brett to take it from here. Um, and I'm going to make him presenter because he said that he's got some slides to show. So, Brett, I'm going to make you presenter now. Thanks, Thanks Joel. Joel. Oh, sorry, um, you might just have to – there we go. All right, that should be you now. Okay. How's that? Can everyone see that? Can you see that screen, Joel? I can. Um, LT body multi body dynamics. Right, right. Okay. okay. Um, good afternoon, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and it's good to be on the call today. Um, so just a quick introduction. Um, as Joel said, my name is Brett Longhurst. I'm the owner and director at Bremer. Um, I've got a, uh, I guess, a pretty long automotive engineering background, um, and I've been involved in various aspects of automotive uh, vehicle design and engineering for around 15 years now. So my background was at uh, at Holden during development of VE Commodore, um, where I was in the powertrain department, focused mainly on FEA um, rather than multi-body stuff. And then um, after that, uh, started consulting work through Bremar and um, have kind of developed a good relationship with Hyperworks uh, over the years and, and we've become resellers for uh, Hyperworks recently and, and yeah, use the whole range of uh, Hyperworks products from FEA through multi-body and some of the CFD solutions and, and stuff as well. So um, just a quick outline of the talk I'm going to give briefly this afternoon. Um, just going to have a quick look, uh, an overview of what multi-body dynamics is and what it's all about and how you might be able to use it. Um, a few MBD examples um, that we've done here at Bremar over the, the last few years. Uh, and I'll finish on a, a, an example that one of our um, employees has done uh, recently on a Formula SAE car as well using Motion View and Motion Solve. So for those who don't know about multi-body dynamics, it's basically a simulation method um, for, for analysing and simulating mechanisms and, and dynamic systems. Um, these type of systems are generally uh, ones that can undergo large overall displacements compared to the, you know, how big the part is. So this is, I guess, in contrast to something like FBA where the displacements and deflections are generally quite small. Uh, Multi-body is looking at sort of large displacement um, systems. Um, in terms of modelling those systems, they're typically represented as, as a, a bunch of rigid bodies which are all connected together by joints of various types. Um, you can also have springs and dampers and gears, cables, contacts and a whole range of other I guess, um, interactions between those, those rigid bodies. Um, the multi-body codes have full dynamic and non-linear capabilities as well, which really broaden out um, the types of work you can simulate with them. And you know, in terms of the type of simulations that you can do, and that, that, that particularly at Bremer we focus on around uh, things like automotive suspension systems, um, looking at suspension kinematics of, of automotive type applications. Um, a good one is uh, for checking clearances and developing packaging envelopes uh, for these uh, something like a suspension system where you can turn the wheel and uh, look, figure out what how much space that wheel needs to move. Um, you can look at uh, generating loads on components, um, which you can then feed into FEA analysis and optimization analysis. Um, and also you generate stresses and uh, using flex bodies, which I think uh, Joel's gonna touch on a bit later on. And, uh, and also vehicle handling simulation. So there's a really wide range of um, applications for multi-body simulations. And um, 
I said, they can go from range from quite simple right through to very complex type simulation. And so, so I'll just flick quickly through a few examples that we've done here at Bremar over the years uh, using the multi, the, sorry, using the Altair multi-body tools. Um, so this is an automotive seat where we simulated the, the pivoting mechanism, the locking and other efforts and work out what springs to use in terms of assist springs and, and that type of thing. Um, that mechanism had quite a complex uh, locking mechanism at the bottom to unlock the seat tracks and, and pivot the back of the seat. So this is probably a more extreme I and mean, complex example of what you can achieve. But um, yeah, this was all done within motion, your motion soul. Uh, getting back to some more suspension type work, this is uh, the type of stuff we do fairly regularly looking at suspension kinematics, steering envelopes, um, camber and car cluster and toe change curves throughout the suspension travel. Stresses on components. Um, another example where a full um, vehicle model was used to drive up um, different uh, road profiles and look at the stresses in, in suspension components and the chassis in particular. That one was for a triangulated four bar linkage. So again, looking at effects like whether you use a bush on the end of the arms or whether you use a, a spherical joint, that can affect you know what loads are going into chassis and suspension components. And that was what uh, that particular example was all about. Oh, so, so, sorry, Brett. Just, um, um, sorry, I'm not too sure. Just to make sure, can everyone see Brett's screen? Just before we move on, because I've got my tag here just saying waiting to view Brett's screen. It's all. So can everyone see his screen at the moment or not? Okay, sorry, Brett, we're not able to see your screen at the moment. You can see me, you can hear me? Yep. All right. What do, what do you want to do, Joel? Do you want to go back to the top or...? Uh, yeah, look, if you want to go back to it, that's more than fine. I'm sure everyone will be interested to see what you had. Sorry, I just wanted to make sure. Okay. <laughs> sure. All right. I'll just skip back. I'm assuming everyone can hear, so uh, I might um, skip the intros and just start at some of these examples. There wasn't much to see prior to that. So, uh, um, so yeah, as, as you probably heard, um, this is a, an example of a, a seat uh, mechanism that we uh, did for one of the automotive interior suppliers here in Melbourne and looked at um, yeah, simulating the whole pivot system, the latching, unlatching type mechanism and uh, calculating uh, lift as well to, you know, Get the right amount of, of uh, load at the at the user's handle and that kind of thing, um, and yeah, the the unlatching mechanism down at the seat track was was quite complex. So you can see there's a number of moving parts there, um, sliding joints, pivoting joints, friction springs, all that kind of stuff. So this is probably towards the upper end of, of complexity for these type of multi-body um, simulations for this sort of application. Uh, this is an example of uh, suspension kinematics and, and loading that I mentioned. Um, yes, steering, um, caster change and toe change throughout the, steer, the suspension travel as well. This is uh, yeah load generation and stress uh, calculation of a, of a vehicle driving up various um, slopes and, and as I mentioned before the um, the joint stiffness whether you use bushings on the end of those arms or spherical uh, rose joint um, top joints um, can affect the loads and and so we did a lot of back to back comparisons um, using this model to to have a look at how stress is developed within the arms and the chassis itself. Uh, um, accredited by um, the National Heavy Vehicle Regulator here in Australia to do uh, simulations of, of large vehicle combinations. So we assess the safety and stability of these vehicles using a range of uh, different simulations. So these are quite a large and complex model. You know, we've done um, simulations of trucks. 
tanks with up to 120 wheels on them, so they get quite big and quite complicated. Um, but yeah, they're used in a in a whole range of scenarios. This one is a, a truck driving up a bumpy road, and we look at how far the rear trailer um, off tracks from the front axle. Uh, we look at rollover stability, so this is a simulation of a tilt table test, um, which is part of the requirements for some of these vehicles. Um, um, and that's affected by, yeah, suspension parameters, centre of gravity height and, and that sort of thing. So what uh, payload the, the truck is running um, determines a lot of that and, uh, yeah, can affect the rollover stability of, of these type of vehicles. Um, it's another way of assessing the rollover stability, just basically driving around and around in a circle and increasing the speed until the vehicle uh, rolls over. Um, and this is another application where we um, developed a, a full vehicle model. We correlated that model to a, a uh, instrumented vehicle down at Anglesey Proving Ground and did a range of manoeuvres from a lane change to uh, extreme braking, um, a sign steer um, slalom through witches hats and that kind of thing. So we built uh, a model of the, the complete vehicle that matched the one at the, that we used for the testing. Um, correlated the model at the vehicle level, so in terms of lateral Gs and uh, yaw rates and, and that type of uh, output, which we were able to log. And then we we're able to propagate um, that down to the component level and generate loads on the component. So you're seeing here loads on the lower control arm um, through a, a lane change manoeuvre. So to actually instrument a lower control arm and, and output those sort of loads um, in a physical environment is, is quite difficult um, in terms of the sensors that you would require and, and uh, setting that up. So um, it was you know in this application anyway simpler for us to correlate things like vehicle level response like uh, lateral Gs, make sure the vehicle and the, um, the simulation were behaving similarly and then we could propagate those loads down to the component level. So in this case we're pulling those loads out to do a, an FEA analysis on the lower control arm and, and some other components in the suspension system. Uh, this is another example. We do a, a fair bit of work with types of sort of scenarios to do with um, towed vehicles. Um, and this, uh, I guess, little clip shows a few examples of how we can extract, again, loads on suspension components um, over yeah, various terrains and, and loading scenarios. Um, and then also looking at um, that last example where the, the trailer is being towed over here, um, we were looking at bush stiffnesses and how much that affects suspension compliance and, uh, and challenge changes the geometry of the suspension and what effect that has on the handling of the trailer as well. Uh, this is a, a linkage front suspension uh, on a motorbike. Uh, this is a personal project of mine that we've kind of been fiddling with over the over the years. But um, this is all about calculating motion ratios, looking at spring rates, damper rates, and, and developing the mechanism, figuring out where all the pivot points had to be to, to get the, uh, the kinematics and the stability into the suspension design. And then that brings me through now to, I guess, some examples that might be a bit more relevant to, to you guys. So this is an example that was um, done by a, a previous employee of ours, Alan McNaughton. Um, so he was part of the Monash team um, for a number of years, and this is a, a model that he built um, during his time with us. Of so uh, Al's um, final year project was uh, involving a hydro pneumatic suspension system on the on the SAE car. So um, as Part of that, and a little bit of an aside, he's, he uh, built a, a dynamic, dynamic model of the full suspension system as well as representing the hydro pneumatic um, aspects of it as well to, to help try and tune the vehicle and, and that side of things. So it was a pretty um, yeah interesting project for Alan and he, yeah, he did really well executing it. So um, just to look into the a little bit more of the detail. Um, so this is an example of, of uh, the multi-body model as viewed in motion view, which is effectively the pre-processor for, for multi-body. So this is where you build the model, um, define all of the bodies and the joints and that kind of thing. So um, you can see here down the side, that's a, basically a tree showing the, the full vehicle model. And you, you can see it's broken down into systems from the, yeah, the body, the front suspension, rear suspension and whatnot. So in that um, tree there, I've got the front suspension system expanded and you can see it's made up of a number of bodies, which in this case are all rigid bodies. So we're talking about uh, the chassis, lower control arm, upper control arm, push rods, wheels, the whole, every body in that system is represented as a, as a rigid body. 
those bodies are all joined together via a, a range of joints. So there's a, an example of a revolute joint, which is the big disc type graphic you see there. So that's effectively a, a hinge type joint. Uh, and then down the bottom, there's spherical joints, which are shown as a, a little ball there. Um, but there's a whole range of, of joints and uh, methods of connecting together those rigid bodies to form the sort of mechanisms and constraints that you require. There's also a number of springs and dampers in, in this system in particular. Um, now the springs and dampers can be something as simple as a, just a linear stiffness value, just a single K value for stiffness, through to nonlinear curves based on displacement, or in this case, Alan's written a whole set of formulas and uh, matrices and stuff in the background, which uh, relates to the hydropneumatic aspects of, of the suspension system. So this is actually quite quite a complex uh, little setup that's going on here in terms of the springs and dampers and how those spring forces are, are calculated in this system. So once you've built the model, joined everything together, defined all your, your uh, model parameters and masses, inertias, all that kind of thing, then you move on to developing a task, which is basically the analysis um, side of things. So what are the inputs, what are the outputs you're after, um, and that kind of thing. So here's a little snippet from, again, the, um, the model tree for Alan's um, model. Um, and this is just a vertical load test. So just moving the wheel up and down, looking at um, things like the kinematics and some of the loads that are output. So there's, you can use curves to define the travels. Um, you can apply forces or motions. So depending whether you're interested in the, um, the loads within the parts or just the kinematics um, would define whether you um, apply forces or, or motions. And there's also a few joints in there. You may need to add in dummy joints or, or um, uh, aspects that aren't actually part of the physical model, but you need to add in to, to get the uh, loads and constraints applied correctly for this application. The output, once you've defined all that, you, you click the run button, it'll go away and run and come back with a, an animation um, along these lines, as well as a whole heap of outputs um, that you can plot and look at in graphs and that kind of thing. So in this example, um, like I said, if you're looking at motion ratios on the what the, the vertical wheel rate um, is compared to the, the spring rates or the, the hydraulic system um, rates, and also look at calculating some of the loads in those components and joints, which help then um, size how big the arms need to be or how big the joints need to be. Uh, Alan's example here, um, he was looking um, at the effects of whether of what the effects, sorry, of an open diff or a um, locked diff has on cornering. So um, in this case, you can see the vehicle, so it's the full vehicle model now, driving under its own steam, driven by the rear wheels, um, being given a steering input and basically driving around in a, in a 360 degree um, circle. So he's done that for both open diff and, and a locked diff and comparing some of the outputs now. So you can see um, some of those plots on the right, the top plot is showing basically the path of each of those vehicles. Um, and you can see that the, the lock diff actually runs a much wider radius uh, throughout that, that turn. Um, and also a comparison of the rear tyre forces, so the longitudinal drive force on those tyres. And again, you can see that quite a marked difference between um, the lock diff and the open diff, uh, much more consistent sort of uh, driving loads on the, on the open diff. Um, and that's just a brief example of what you can um, simulate and compare for these these types of multi-body analyses. So, um, this is just a, an overlay of the two um, diff configurations as well, so this gives you a really good visual on what effect that has. And you can, again, you can see that the um, the lock diff runs a much wider arc and, um, and it pushes into a much wider um, radius turn. So in summary, that's uh, they're the examples I was, I was going to present today. So uh, I guess in summary, you know, the multi-body tools are really a, a really powerful tool for design and development of, of these types of dynamic systems and mechanisms. You know, they give you a, a lot of insight, um, a lot of understanding in terms of what loads are within individual components in a way that you really can't measure in a lot of senses. Um, you know, even you can't physically put sensors on to measure a lot of these loads. So I think that's where a lot of the benefits of these type of simulation tools come in. Um, yeah, you, you get a lot of power over here, you define systems and what sort of outputs you view from them. Um, in terms of the motion view or motion solve um, capabilities, you know, 
they're a full um, multi-body system. You know, there's really no limits uh, on complexity you build into the system. You know, you can make it as simple or as complicated as you require. You're not limited by, um, you know, templates necessarily. That there are um, templates there to help you build systems. Um, but if you need to customize that or add your own joints and bodies and that kind of thing, you know, there's no limitation to that, which makes it again a really powerful tool for understanding these types of systems. And uh, and finally, just start using it. Get into it. Um, it's uh, it is quite complex, and it's uh, it, it takes a while to get your head around and learn. But once once you get it nutted out, it's a really powerful tool. And um, yeah, it'd be great to see more people using it. And I think for the types of applications we're talking here with the SAE cars, there's a lot of stuff that you guys are coming up with that you could um, you know trying to implement on the cars, and you know you can use to either uh, you know develop and assess new and innovative systems or even just to get you know to the level of getting accurate loads for your FEA analysis and optimization and, and that type of stuff there's a whole range of ways it could be used in the SAE application so um, yeah my advice is if it's uh, of interest just just get into it start using it you know Joel's here I'm here to help anyone who's interested in um, using these tools and um, yeah it'd be great to see uh, some more applications for this so just uh, in closing, there's my contact details as well. If everyone, if anyone wants to um, get in touch with me, just drop me a, an email, brett at Bremar Auto, or, or look me up on LinkedIn and um, yeah, connect with me there. And uh, yeah, the, the Bremar site, it's just bremarauto.com. So um, thanks for your time. If there's any questions, I'll, I'll hand it back to Joel now. But um, yeah, by all means, feel free to shoot me an email or a, or a question anytime. Thanks, Joel. No worries, Brett. Thank you very much. Um... I'll just get you to hand me back to presenter. Um, so I hope everyone enjoyed that because I know that was very interesting for me as well um, to, see, to see some really high-end uh, motion solve going on there. Um, hang on, I'll just... Okay, so what I'm going to quickly or briefly go through today um, is I'm going to go through... A generation of a flexible body and how to bring that into a model so what that will sort of go back to is one of the first uh, webinars back on OptiStruct about how we generated the uh, modal frequencies um, in a body this is just another way of doing that and then bringing that into a model itself and seeing how that works and then I'll also be going through um, some of the wizard tools, which are sort of pre-made tools to quickly build a generic car and then being able to change the parameters in that to, um, to your design and also how to import and export systems, uh, which is a very powerful tool, again, because you can build systems very slowly and then start to import that into a full model. Um, but yeah, I guess, look, we'll, we'll jump straight into it. And um, yeah, so for a flexible body, um, we want to start off. So when you're doing this, you want to have a .fem file. So your, your solver deck generated through HyperMesh. Um, and best to use, uh, if you are using rigid links and spiders, best to use when you're bringing them into motion solve using RBE2s. Um, as RBE3s don't work so well. So if you are going to generate your flexible bodies through motion, so make sure you, you uh, use them with RBE2s. So we start off with going to Flex Tools and Flex Prep. So this opens up, uh, just making sure everyone can see my uh, window. Yep, good. Okay. So what we've got here is we want to Optistruct Flex Body Generation. That's... That is our goal for this. And we want to create an Optistruct preparation file and generate the H3D flex body. But there's obviously a few different range, range of uh, options here, but generally we'll just stick with this one. And we'll keep the translate Adams MNF file into MV H3D flexible body. So this is where you bring in your .fem file or your .nas file, uh, depending on what you're using. Um, just simply by clicking the select bulk data file. And then we'll go to motion solve flexible bodies and I bring in the flexible, the flex left fem file. So this would be what's created from your CAD model in HyperMesh. You've meshed it and you 
exported out. Um, so now, if there is sections on it that do have RBE threes or no rigids, um, where there would be constraints, we can quickly do that simply by clicking on Create RBE Two Spiders. What this will do now is this opens up the HyperMesh window, and this allows for generation or changing of certain elements from RBE threes to RBE twos or creation of RBE twos around where you will have um, nodes where forces will be applied or constraints will be applied. We don't physically apply the force or constraints. We're simply allowing the solver to know where they are if we do have them. So we'll just let that load up because this is this is a fast thing, but it is quite important, um, especially just to be able to see it. Okay. So as this loads up, it'll come into the utility, it'll come automatically into the utility screen and it'll load up our model here. So we, we can now have changing of the model. You may recognize this uh, view. What we do is down the bottom here, you've got four different options, geom, mesh, user, this or QA slash model. We go to user. This is if you want to change it. And how to do it is you can click on super spider. And then you can select the nodes around the hole to immediately create one. Um, but as you can see, we've already got them all created, but this is just showing where you can do it. And you would click proceed, but because I'm not selecting one. And then like just like in normal HyperMesh, if you were going to change your elements, you can go to 1D, um, choose your edit element, element type. So and then you can change it like that by s selecting them. So that's just how you can change them quickly and then you simply just get out of it when you're done or you hit save and close. But because I haven't changed the model, I'm just going to escape out of it. And now, because I didn't save anything, I'm going to have to re-ask that. Now, you select the H3D file that you want to save it as. So I've already got one saved, but for the... Yep, we'll replace. So this is where now you, this is where your H3D file will be saved. And this is where now you specify the nodes that will have an interface. Um, so either a constraint or a force. So for this model, we've got them in 4887. You can either hit plus and just go to the next one. And then plus, um, and then we've got 4890, but you can also do the double double dots which means continue on so if I wanted to I could go to four eight nine zero the colon and then go to four four nine zero zero and it'll select all the nodes within that parameter but for this I'm only going to four eight nine one. Now you choose your highest mode so your cutoff value we want we'll take 15. Um, you can have your solver as the land cost method and we want to perform stress and strain recovery. Okay um, element check yes, select all your units and then hit OK. What that does is that generates your flexible body and then what you can do now from once it's generated, I can show you how to mirror that body and, um, and that way then you only need to generate, use one FEM file and you can generate two uh, H3D models to be brought into the multi MBD model. Okay, so as you can see, it only took nine seconds, quite quick, hit OK. Now, we haven't imported anything yet, so don't stress that nothing is in the screen, um, but the files are being created. And so then what we would do is we would go to Flex Tools, Flex Prep, and we would go Translation of Flexible Body Files. And then we would mirror existing H3D Flexible Body and you would specify the first H3D file that we just created, so the left one, then you would do the right, and then you would name the new one, and then you select the plane you want to mirror that on. So I'm not going to do that now because I've already got them mirrored, but this is how then you would mirror those bodies. Okay, so from that, we now want to bring those into a multi-body dynamics model. So. What we're going to do is we're going to go to Model, Assembly Wizard, 
and we're going to go front end vehicle. So when you do this as well, you are able to automatically do a whole full a full vehicle simply by clicking through full vehicle. But for the moment, and then going through the parameters, but for the moment, we're just going to start with the front end. And we'll go next. You can choose a drive line configuration. Anyone you want, you can have a front wheel, rear wheel, or four wheel. Um, we're just going to go a generic no wheel drive line for the moment. And you can look at your, so for this one, because we are only generating a front, um, front of the vehicle, we've only got a front suspension section and we can automatically body fix to the ground. Uh, you've got different kinds of, you've got subframes, um, you've got it's suspension, all different kinds of suspension setups there. Um, your steering linkages, you've got a couple of different steering and powertrain, you can add in that one as well. For a front, and for the, for this model at the moment, uh, we can keep that all as the as the default. And then again, for the same for the steering column, you can either have none or steering column one. Uh, you can add in a steering boost and front struts, front stabilizer bars. You can add all these in um, as a generic to build your generic model, and then all those parameters can be changed once you've created them. Uh, you can have in some front jounce bumpers and rebound bumpers. All right, then we'll finish. And this is what's automatically generated from the uh, from the assembly wizard. And all these things in here, everything in here is able to be manipulated and changed simply by going through the different sections. So definitely when you do this, I recommend having a good look at what's already built going through them and just going through the parameters and the configurations to really give yourself a good idea of what is already set up and also what you can change. So what we're going to do is we're going to set up also now the ride analysis. So we need to go to analysis task wizard. So we set up the task and the front end tasks is we just want a static ride analysis. You can do single wheel analysis, roll analysis. You've got all these different kinds that you can do. We're just going to do a static ride. Then we go next and we finish. Okay, so here you can put in your vehicle parameters. So you've got your static loaded, tire static loaded radius, vertical spring rate, um, and these are all, these all can be changed. So you can change front to rear. Um, so it is very manipulatable, as Brett was mentioning. Um, very powerful and you can do a lot of stuff even with the default uh, build models by being able to just put in your own parameters. And so we're just gonna keep them all as default and we'll finish that. Okay. So now in the model browser, we want to expand the system folder for the front SLA or the front suspension and then bodies. Okay, so what we want to do, so, so we want to click on the lower control arm, as you can see down here, as this is the section that we're working in. So this is the frequency model that we've just built. And then we're going to put it into the model and see how those frequencies interact um, in the analysis. So in the lower control arm, and we're going to deselect symmetric, pro symmetric properties. And we're going to click retain. And then we're going to hit flex body CMS. And we want both sides to be deformable. Yes. So this is where we get to now bring in our graphics file. So in the graphic file, we making sure you know which bit you're in, because if you're in the right one, you import the left one, it's going to be back to front. So we're in the left one, we'll go to graphic file, we'll go to flexible bodies, and we'll bring in our flexible left. Okay, and now what we want to do is we want to click on nodes, and we want to have small tolerance and find all. So this is why we put in those some of those nodes at the start as well, because this helps the generator to find those um, points. We go close. Now we go to modes. 
So for those of you who attended the OptiStruct um, webinar, you may remember how I was mentioning about the first six modes being rigid body modes, and then everything after that uh, are proper modes. You can see here how the first six are not selected already, as because it already the solver already knows them as rigid body modes. So the analysis starts at the first seven and below. So that's uh, really handy, but you view that just to make sure in modes, but you can also put them into your analysis simply by clicking them. We'll go close. And now we want to do that to the right side as well. So clicking right. Now we'll select our flexible right. And as you may be able to notice now, we've got our, um, we've got our arms in there, in here. So that's all been in there now. And we've got to do nodes again, so make sure you do all this for both of them. Nodes and then modes. Just to have a look. Beautiful. Okay, so what we can do now is we're actually able to run this really quickly simply by now clicking on run, giving it a file to run it, and an end time. So we won't run this now, but uh, for the run time, you can have that as five seconds, two seconds. And making sure you have a good save and then once that is in you hit run and it runs so what we can pull out of that is if we go to here now so this is by changing to our results this is the simple just a simple model um, with our new newly created, created flexible body um, from our control arm of what we may see in the cars designed and just to have a bit of fun with it we can just click apply with the displacement and we can see how this moves. And now we can also change the frequency through it. So you can we'll choose, change the time, sorry. But this is all how it's going through with each of those frequencies. And this is what's expected to be seen. So this is a great way of quickly putting it into a model and seeing how those frequencies interact with some default properties. But also it's recommended to slowly build up this kind of model to start to mimic the actual car that you guys and girls will be building and designing yourselves. So this, I thought this would be a great spot for everyone to maybe start, um, just to get used to slowly building a generic model and getting used to some of the properties. And then you can also see the forces inside there. Um, we can just click on that and you can click apply. As you can see, it gives you the force outputs. You can have oh, it's magnitude, but and go to stress and strain so we can see the stresses put through the model you can play that and you can see now how those stresses changing as these are flexing up and down as well as strains you can see the strains then and this now gives you a bit of an idea of also and you can pull these forces out to then begin to do a, uh, a structural analysis and begin your optimization techniques as well so this is why it's a good spot to start with some of these multi-body dynamics tools, just to get an idea of the loads that they will be put under during driving. Okay, so that is uh, the generation of flexible bodies from a mesh file um, and put into a car and then using the car parameters and the suspension parameters and some motion to analyze what those control arms are put under during driving or going over potholes and hills and divots, what, you know, what, what, whatever you expect your car to be seeing is definitely how you want to uh, simulate it. So what I'm going to go through now is starting to build up a simple car part and then exporting that system, which can then be used to be brought into a full model just by building it system by system. So what we're going to do is this here is just an MDL model. Um, just a simple CAD part MDL model. But what I'm going to show you is, um, is how to do those things and where some of those parameters are as we build it. But And remembering one thing as well, always seeing when, when you bring in some of these, these models that are already built is making sure to see what motions are already given so you know what to also be looking at when the analysis occurs. So as you can see, we've got a ride motion, it's up and down. We've got a steering motion, so we're going to be turning a little bit. And then we've got the wheel rotating around the wheel uh, joint there. So this also shows where some of these joints are and what they're actually going to be doing. And you can view them here. Some more joints. So you've got your 
knuckle to body and wheel to knuckle. So you've got a couple of different knuckles there. And you may see these yellow sections here. These are just points. So points give location um, in coordinates and can be used to start to define where parts of the model are and also directions. But that'll be shown as we go through it. So what we're going to do is we're going to create some explicit graphics is what it's called. And how we're going to do that is we're going to right click on the spring damper uh, here. So sorry. So all down here, like in Hive Mesh, these are all the build model tools. And you right click to open one up. Okay. So what we're going to do with this is we're going to create a coil spring. And you've got a number that you can create a torsion spring as well. But for this will be a coil spring. And we're going to create a pair. And we want to create the explicit graphics so we can visually see them as well. You can change the label um, to it. But for the variable, making sure that there's no gap. So the variable must always have like an underscore, um, no special characters, very simple, like this, like when you're setting up your CFD uh, run files. But we'll just keep that all the same for the moment. And we're just going to hit OK. All right. So for the spring damper, and now, what we need to do here, as you can see, it's already highlighted. And then this is this, and we've got the left and right because we've created the pair. And we can do symmetric properties. And then you choose a, a dominant side. So for this one, we're just going to select the left. Okay. Now, what you need, now with mo with motion solve and multi-body dynamics, you always need to have a body moving relative to another body. Um, so that's what you'll see down here, and, and then you'll have points as well, like relative points um, to be able to measure. So for the body one, we're going to put this to the ground body, and body two, and then body two will be to the knuckle. So that is how the knuckle is moving in regards to the ground body. And you can always click up here to see where the knuckle is, and that's our knuckle. That's what the uh, graphic's showing us. Okay, so that's in the graphics uh, folder there. So we'll go back to the spring damper. Now the point. So the point one we'll call the knuckle top. That's the top of the knuckle. And then point two will be the knuckle center. So that there shows, now we can see that we've just built a simple coil spring. Um, it's got an inner and an outer. Okay, so that's how you can quickly do that. Now, what you're able to do is have a look at the properties and you can change. So if you were starting to model the suspension coil that you see on your car, this is where you can start to put in those properties. You can put in your spring constant, your K, or, and your damping coefficient, your C. Um, remembering that these values here do follow Hooke's law, so the, the program does follow Hooke's law. Um, if you aren't aware of what Hooke's law is, definitely do a little bit of reading on it. Um, it's a very, very prominent tool within engineering. Um, okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to create a graphic for the spring damper. And um, so also you can add in a preload as well if you wish. And you can use distance between points, you can add in a preload value. For the moment, we're just going to leave it all similar. Okay, so what we can do now is we're going to right click on the model and we're going to go to add and it's going to be a reference entity. So we need to reference where this is going to be and we're going to choose it as a graphic. So for this one, because we're going to create a top and bottom, um, definitely worthwhile putting them on the label. So I'm going to go top. And this will be a pair, sorry, singular. Um, and then we can go OK. OK, so same thing again. We need to add a body, a direction, and an origin. Actually, hang on, sorry. I must redo that again. I'll, I'll cut that. I'll create that graphic again because it was meant to be a pair. Add. Reference entity, graphic, pair, cylinder, go OK. So now our body, we want to choose 
oh, sorry, our parent is going to be the knuckle direction. So this is now the direction of that from the knuckle. Which way is it going? And we're going to put that as damper middle. And then our origin will be the knuckle center. So that there shows us where we're going. So that's where we can see where it's highlighted, where it's been put into the model. So it's a great way of knowing whether you've actually selected the correct ones. Okay. <clears throat> oh, sorry. So once you set up everything and you've given it all the correct properties, so you can go through here again, change the radius of your coils, um, adding caps, you can change the material properties as well, which is really handy. So you can change it from materials. Um, you can change the visualization properties, so you can change the colors of them. As you can see, it changes it up there. Uh, got inertia properties, so this is automatically generated from your properties, which is good. So you're able to do all, you're able to change all those simple little things. Um, and then obviously with your spring dampers, you can change all, going back to them, you can change all the loading properties in that as well. So what we're going to do now is we want to add an output for this analysis. Um, how we do that is you've got this um, little squig two squiggly lines, add output, and we can right click on that. And we're just going to label the output and variable, and we're just going to go OK. So now we've opened up our output section. So you see in the tree, we've got a new folder now, outputs. And what we're going to do is we want to we want to go to a force. Um, and we're going to change the body to the spring damper because it's not a body. We want it as the spring damper. So we can click on the spring damper, and then we can select either one. So we're going to select the left one. Then we can give it a reference marker if you wish. You can tell it it's an entity set or an entity. Um, so you're able to do all this in there. Um, yeah. So th this is how you then start to create your outputs. Uh, you can create more than one output, obviously. Um, and you've got all the different ones here. So you can I, I even come up with your own expression. So like Brett was mentioning about the uh, gentleman from Monash with the FSA, he was coming up with his own matrix and matrices and expressions to be put into his spring. So you're able to do that as well to really start to define what, like really constrain what you're looking for and um, start to really build your own models really well by doing that. But doing the expressions is not an easy thing. So definitely if you are wanting to go down that path, do a lot of reading up on it, researching of the springs and what you're trying to model and making sure you know what you're going to put in for what you want to get out as well. But for this one, we're just going to sit nice and simple and we're just going to go to entity, force entity, get our spring damper and we've got our reference marker as our global frame. You can, you can even change to the markers if you wish, but we're going to keep it as both. And then once that happens, again, we click on the run button, have your simulation type it transient, so you can, but you can have a number of different ones. Give it an end time, an interval time, give it a file and then hit run. So then what we can pull out of that, something very simple like this, as you can see, and I've got my force there, it's giving it force, and then you can just run that and we can see why, we can see how that, um, Comes with the comes with the model. So as we can see, we've got the up and down motion that's prescribed. We've got the wheel turn that's prescribed. Um, so making sure that the the output has the correct motions that you're looking for, that what you've input. <sighs> but yeah, so this is what you're able to start to build, and then I'll show you how to export this as a system to be able to then import that into another system if you wish as you build your models. As you can see, I've only got forces and moments because that's all we've asked, to, asked for. And only magnitude X, Y, and Z as well. So we'll go back to our model. Now to create a system, we want to go to the model browser. And sorry, model, highlight that, right click, add system, slash assembly, 
and we want to do either system or assembly. For this one, we're going to do a system. We can go, so you can also do assemblies. Go next. The parent is the model. And you give the variable a name, give it a label and a definition. It's going to go OK. We'll leave it all as default for the moment. So as you can see here, we've got a new, a whole new folder. And what you're able to do now is what you want to do is you want to move um, all the modeling statistics, everything that we're using to model this into this system. So you might want to be moving your graphics. So you highlight, cut, paste. As you can see now, it comes into there and it gives you the graphics folder and they've come back in. And you would do that with everything. Um, so we want to have bodies, joints, motions, outputs, points, spring dampers, and graphics. And we're going to cut everything and go back into the system and go paste. So now we've got everything imported into that system. So this could be our entire front end that we have here that we would want to start to put into, say, a full car model. And by breaking it into systems, you can then start to create your own variables within that system. And as you can see, you can add in simple variables, um, compliant, yes, no, but your initial conditions. So you can start to add in conditions just relevant to the system. Um, you can translate it, so this makes it very easy um, to be able to then move between your front, like so if when you import another system, say your rear, your rear suspension and wheels, they may end up on the same spot. You can now translate that with a, in regards to, say, the X as a distance. Then you've got the import and export. So we're gonna, we want to export this. You want to have that as MDL statements. And then you would give it a file and you type in that file export underscore system, save, and then quick export. Then we can go back in and make sure that that's done that. And we've got them all there. And then you can go back and then save the entire, entire model like this. Okay, so that is and there's our export system there, our MDL. And then you can use that to import as well. So, whew, sorry guys, I know it's a lot to take in. Probably for, for a number of you, maybe the first time seeing a model like this. But it, um, from what Brett was going over, it can become a very, very, very powerful tool in starting to design um, your car as 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 a first start as well, not just as an optimizing for this tension springs or the preloading or your C and K values, but actually understanding just some basic dynamics and forces of the car as well. So it is a very good uh, uh, spot to start, as well as a very good spot for design to finish as well. To see the final performance of the vehicle once you've built and optimized everything and you put it back together. Um, and I think also the model with the FSA car would have been very interesting to see that cornering difference um, because there's obviously not a huge amount of straights at the track, but there's a lot of tight corners and being able to move the car as fast as you can through them and also the wide sweeping corner up the end of the track will definitely benefit, I think, all teams in trying to even have a look and understand where you can use this as well as the tilt table. Um, as that is a criteria factor for the FSAE, could be a very good spot for people to practice this um, in setting up a tilt table model as well. So I definitely recommend everyone give this a go. Um, like always, in the help section, you've got the Hyperworks help. You've got a lot of help and tutorials in there that will take you through the building of these um, and some understanding. As well as Brett said, look, Brett's given his contact details there. Um, definitely, if you if you're able to sh shoot Brett an email, because I'm sure he, he's more than happy to help out and to see sort of the students tr try and implement this um, so sort of work within the FSAE here in Australia, um, as it is heavily used in Europe 
and that and as you would know if you've been over there, the cars over there are quite quite intense um, and they're extremely well built. So this is probably the next step I think for Australian FSAE is to really start to use MDB to um, as a final works on the car to really start getting down some dynamics and understanding as well. But I think that's that's all from me today, guys. I tried to keep that to an hour, and I've got it to 2.59, so pretty happy with that. I'm going to just stop the recording, but thank you very much for all attending, and thank you to Brett, who's also hung around. Um, so I really appreciate that, and I hope everyone appreciated his time as well. So thank you very much.